Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, so today we have a different kind of, of seminar. So we're gonna have a, a combination of four different speakers that have different experience. And this seminar is actually called Explore the World, Applications for Fulfilling the PhD Supplemental Requirements. So we, they're gonna give you a different experience that they have been having to their, their journey in, in during, through, through their, their PhD here at AOS. So they have different experiences like summer school, workshops, field campaigns, and internship that they, they have been doing that can complete that those requirements to complete their PhD. So we're gonna start with Juliet. We have four different PhD students. We have Juliet, Julia, Juliet Pulaski, Julia Shade, Rudra, Rudra Tucker, and Ben Krodersky. So we're gonna start with Julia, Juliet Pulaski, sorry. <laughs> No worries, we've been having that issue since uh, day one five years ago, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, my name is Juliet Poluski, um, and before I begin, um, I just want to let everyone know that we're just going to go through all the talks, about 10 or 11 minutes each, and then um, open for some discussions um, and for questions for all of us. So today I'm going to present on my research experience that I had in France this summer. Um, it is all applications towards my third chapter of my PhD. And so I was in Toulouse down here as a visiting uh, PhD student at Meteo France working with a scientist named Dominique Bouillot. Um, and so I just wanted to thank her and that whole group there um, for inviting me, giving me this opportunity, and also um, partially funding my um, research there. And then also, so I was there in Toulouse for one month, and then I was in a town called Orsay, just south of Paris, about 10 miles south of Paris, um, at an atmospheric water cycle workshop that Tristan, uh, my advisor, uh, co-organized. Um, at, at the Institute Pascal. And so I just wanted to also give a shout out and thanks to um, the Institute for funding my experiences there. Um, so just to begin, a little bit of an overview of my PhD. My work is mainly focused on studying convective systems role in Earth's energy budget and water cycle using spaceborne observations. And so I primarily use um, CloudSat and Clipso measurements, which capture the vertical structure of convective systems on a global scale. And so the first chapter of my PhD research um, has been actually creating a database of these convective systems by um, writing an algorithm that individually identifies um, these profiles. And it's really important to uh, capture these characteristics on a more, on a larger organized sense in order to get the full, um, kind of full understanding of how these convective systems are interacting with the local and large scale environment. Um, and then capturing their cloud precipitation features that are important for influencing the Earth's energy budget. However, um, what is lacking though with these um, atrium observations is that they only occur at um, two times a day, and they're only thin slices of the convective system. So what we need to understand is um, how convection organizes on multiple spatial and temporal scales, um, including over the full convective life cycle. And so then the goal for my PhD um, the third chapter is to use TUCAN um, tracked convective systems and geostationary satellite observations to document the life uh, stage of a train identified convective systems. So um, here is just the image of the afternoon constellation or the A train. There's cloud and Calypso, and then Aqua um, supplies precipitation. And then this here is um, a loop of what is known as the toucan or the tracking of organized convection algorithm through 3D segmentation. Um, this, these um, are distinct MCSs that are tracked over their full life stage and assigned or full life cycle and assign different life stages um, using different brightness temperature thresholds. And so this was created by Tomo Fiolo and Remy Roca at Kness in Toulouse. Um, and so then uh, I want to go a little bit into how did this opportunity even come about for me to go visit Toulouse. Well, so as far as I can date it back, um, 
Tristan went on sabbatical in France, and that furthered his connection with the Toucan group and also laid the groundwork for an atmospheric water cycle workshop that would actually be separate or from um, just me visiting Toulouse. And so that was in fall of, of 2019, and then in summer of 2020, I received the NASA um, Finest Award. It's a fellowship that um, NASA uh, provides or gives students um, every single year, students write up um, a, a proposal for it, and it gave me the flexibility to explore this topic as I see fit, um, and to have international collaborators on the project, which was really nice. And so then in spring 2021, I was on the AOS Department Colloquium Committee at the time, and so I invited Dominique Bunuel for an AOS Colloquium. And Dominique, she was not one of the creators of Toucan, but she worked closely with Thomas and Remy, and she also had more of a radiative and energy budget focus on these convective systems and trying to understand how the, that evolves over the life cycle of MCSs. And so I thought, Tristan and I both thought that our work would be, um, uh, would, would, uh, it would be a nice collaboration. And so during her visit, uh, we met and began brainstorming opportunities for uh, collaboration and for me possibly visiting Toulouse. And so then, about a year later, um, because of COVID and everything, you know, the, the opportunities for um, actually going and visiting was, were somewhat delayed. But about a year later, I ended up uh, reaching out to Dominique over email because this was something that I still wanted to do and, and kind of needed to do in order to understand how to implement this um, algorithm into my, my uh, project. And so I reached out to Dominique over email regarding this opportunity. Um, and then I began planning this trip. Um, and then Tristan, in the meantime, was also co-organizing this atmospheric water cycle workshop, and we um, invited Dominique to that as well. And it was just uh, happened. It happened to also be um, taking place in France, so that was really cool. So then, um, in Meteo, France, in Toulouse, uh, I just have some pictures here. This is where. Um, this is just like pictures of. Um, my neighborhood, I said, essentially, for, for a month. Uh, I got to, um, you know, walk along this canal. Um, these are just, like, areas right uh, in, the, in the apartment complex that I lived in. Uh, this was a beautiful little botanical garden. And then this was um, uh, the Meteo France, I, I guess, campus. It was also affiliated with a, a university, or a college or university. So then, what a month uh, at Meteo France entailed. Um, in terms of my research progress, I learned to read data and co-locate it with A-train uh, convective objects. Um, and then I analyzed case studies and brainstormed with Dominique research questions and methodology to answer them. And so this figure on the right, or figures, shows uh, geostationary satellite observations with a bunch of distinct MCS clusters identified. And they're all um, colored, like all the MCSs are in different colors. Um, and then this line right here is where CloudSat identified this MCS, and I've plotted the radar reflectivity profile of that MCS. And we see here that um, this is where uh, Toucan identified the MCS, and this um, you know, light blue corresponds to the life stage. It had a life stage of about five, and it's normalized from one to nine. And so five is um, about in its peak maturity. And then these are individual um, convective cores that uh, the CloudSat can identify. Um, and so this was really cool, just being able to dig a little bit into these observations. But then in terms of the work culture, or I guess work-life culture, um, I rented a bike, and so I was able to um, ride a bike about 15 miles round trip every single day to the campus. Um, and then what's really nice about the French work culture is that at 10 a.m. everyone in the lab takes a t like a 30 minute coffee break just to like hang out and chill and talk about um, each other's like, you know, kind of personal lives or whatever is going on. Um, and then we all go together to lunch um, every single day at around 1 p.m. and then again uh, just, you know, talk and discuss and get to know each other for an hour, which is really nice. Um, some additional adventures. I actually got to uh, go to Kness for a day and then meet Toma, Fiolo, and Rimi Roca. Um, there was a lab group picnic and swim at a lake near Meteo France. 
I got to hike in the Pyrenees with Dominique Buñol and her daughter. Um, and I became friends with some grad students at CAS, which was really fun. So then on to my experience at the workshop um, in Orsay. Uh, this was an incredible place. Um, so every single day, I uh, hiked two miles just to get to the institute and two miles into the woods. And Tristan also did this, and we have some funny discussions about um, you know how, how the hike was often really steep, and we would both show up kind of sweaty and stuff. But it was still really, really nice because that's how everyone um, went to uh, the institute. And then this was a nice, beautiful, collaborative space um, with with some chalkboards and some. Uh, large screens for people to call in or zoom in. Um, and then this is where we would often have a lot of our discussions. And then this was um, just a, a group of us kind of at the end of the workshop. Um, this is Dominique here, Tristan's here. I also started collaborating with Pierre and Chloe and Helen, um, and then uh, Johnny as well. Um, and so I can't, uh, you know, finish without just talking a little bit more about the Institute Pascal itself. And so it was named after Blaise Pascal, who was a physicist, mathematician, and philosopher, and symbolizes the emphasis on cross-disciplinary work undertaken at University of Paris Saint Clay. And this was a building itself. Um, and so it was really built. It was actually just built in, um, just right before the pandemic to provide a meeting place to facilitate the exchange of ideas and the formation of international collaborations across all of the scientific themes. Um, and I really did feel this way. In terms of the facilitating the collaborations, there was one to two seminars each day, followed by group discuss discussion, um, and then work in smaller groups, and then we had a wine and cheese happy hour every Tuesday, group dinner on Thursday, and then I went and visited Paris um, a couple times with some grad students. And so, um, in addition to working, continuing working with Dominique there, uh, we also um, collaborated with Pierre and Chloe and actually studied more of the relative humidity profiles of where these storm systems were occurring. So just to try to implement or get a better idea of the environment in which these systems were developing. Um, and yeah, I just created lasting collaborations. Um, and so I just wanted to finish with uh, three main takeaways from this experience. So first of all is um, to, I felt that, you know, I could really take the initiative when reaching out for opportunities. Um, and then I found that it is likely that the point of contact will be excited about the potential collaboration, um, especially because us as young um, research scientists, I, I keep hearing this all the time that like we're, we're the future, like people want to talk to us about these new and innovative ideas. So it, it was really exciting kind of like getting that um, sort of sense all the time. Um, and then exposing yourself to new research environments changes your perspective. And so I feel like I have an increased understanding of where my research fits into the scientific community, which is kind of the point of this like supplemental requirement for your PhD. Um, and then also like kind of allowing, or, like taking the pressure off oneself as a grad student. It can be such an isolating experience being a grad student, right? Um, and so just being able to meet other people can really help you um, like take that pressure. Or it, you know, it's a collaborative effort. So um, everyone is backing you up too. Um, and so then lastly, caffeine withdrawals after summer spent drinking French coffee are the worst. So, thanks. <laughs> All right, Ben. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Ben, um, and I will just be briefly discussing today uh, my experience uh, working as a member of the CPEX CD field campaign. Um, and I did this all through uh, this past September, so I just got back a few weeks ago, actually. Oh, yeah, you can just uh, click the, yeah, click that. Okay, cool. Okay, um, so just a little about um, the CPEC-CVD campaign first. Um, so first of all, CPEC-CVD stands for uh, the Convective Processes Experiment, Cabo Verde. 
Um, like I said, I participated in this all throughout the month of September. Um, and it was based in Cabo Verde, um, specifically on Sal Island here off the west coast of Africa. So our base was located just on the southern tip of this island here. Um, and then CPEC CV was the third installment of a three part field campaign CPEC series. Um, so there was CPEX in 2017, which is actually uh, what I'm doing, with, or the data for that is what I'm uh, doing a master's thesis on. Um, there was CPEX AW, which I also participated in in St. Croix last year uh, from mid August through early September. Uh, then obviously CPEX CV, which I'll be discussing here. Um, and just kind of the overarching objectives um, for the whole this whole field campaign series. Um, it's a NASA project, and the overarching goals here are is really to kind of improve the understanding of the interactions between large-scale tropical systems like African Sea Waves, the ITTZ, um, the Saharan Air Layer, African Sea Jet, etc. Um, so, kind of an, an improve the understanding of the interactions between these larger-scale forces. Um, and kind of a more mesoscale vector properties and life cycles. Um, and additionally, how all of these systems, both large and, and mesoscale, kind of interact with each other and also how they may uh, dynamically influence one another. Uh, more specific to my research here, um, I'm studying uh, near-storm environmental relationships uh, with tropical oceanic convective structure. Um, and so, um, again, going back to the field can campaign specifics here. Um, so with CPEX CV, um, it was really based all around uh, science flights um, in the tropical eastern Atlantic region. You can kind of see um, kind of a consolidated map here of all of our 13 research flights here, and then broken down individually. Um, here's some of the location of today's. Um, and these science flights were really targeting, again, African ECB waves. Um, dust uh, coming off of the Saharan Desert, uh, which I'll call the Sal or the Saharan Air Layer. Um, and again, uh, flying in and around tropical oceanic convection, um, both related to easterly waves, not related to easterly waves, um, you know, interacting with dust, not interacting with dust, you know, ITCZ convection. Um, and also, CPIs were interested in, uh, in flying through offshore propagating convection coming off the coast, like, say, this flight here on September 22nd and just kind of study that offshore transition of convection. Um, and additionally, um, ideally with these science flights, in addition to targeting each of these kind of three main targets here, um, ideally we wanted to, um, you know, see interactions amongst all, you know, at least a few of these with one another, um, just to kind of more efficiently um, organize the science flights. Um, so while I was in the field, I had a lot of uh, in-field responsibilities, the main one being uh, being a member of the forecasting team. Um, I was tasked with co-leading the forecasting operations, which involved, um, you know, training all the new forecasters, which are mostly grad students, um, you know, making the schedule, the monthly schedule for everyone um, who's forecasting, who's being a lead, who's supporting. Um, and then additionally, uh, communicating with the project leads um, and the science PIs just doing um, Kind of just you know discuss what uh, forecasting products they would like to see in the daily forecast, and then incorporate those into some sort of forecasting templates. Um, so that was kind of the main job of, of leading the forecasting team. But in forecasters in general, uh, what we would do is every morning uh, we would produce and present a daily uh, five-day uh, weather forecast outlook, um, and then present it at the daily briefing. Um, and then, in addition to just discussing what's going on, what will be going on with regards to the waves, the sal, and convection, um, we would want to um, keep in mind all of the different science PIs, uh, different objectives, and targets, uh, recommend to the flight planners uh, specific flight targets um, in, our flight, in our flight domain around Cabo Verde. Um, again, based on these uh, PI, what we call scorecards. Um, and then additionally, um, right before each flight, uh, we would have to provide a pre-flight weather briefing of just the current conditions, um, just in case we need to tweak any of the flight plans. Okay, so um, in addition to being a forecaster, um, I was also involved with the flight planning um, operations. And basically those were simply just, uh, again, after the forecast briefing, um, designing flight flight plan flight patterns, ideally one to two days out um, the targets, um, and then again, crafting these around the PI's desired 
targets. Um, and then, um, again, as I alluded to earlier, ideally a flight plan would not address just one PI science objective, but multiple PI's objectives. Um, so that was sometimes tricky or challenging at times, but um, it was a it's really important experience. Uh, the third thing um, I did in the field was uh, act as a mission scientist. Um, so after the forecasting and um, the flight planning um, on days that we actually did fly, um, there would be uh, both the flight crew, um, actually obviously flying, and then there would be the ground crew. Um, and most of the ground crew were mission scientists where we would, it was basically just an on-ground support of the flight operations, where we would kind of track live satellite imagery, as you can kind of see here, um, all these giant screens, um, and that was just to help guide um, those in the air, help guide the flight pattern, um, and you know, if there are any adjustments that need to be made, help them make those adjustments. Um, and then also, um, in terms of flying convection, obviously it's hard to forecast convection, you know, you know more than a few hours out. Um, so wherever the convection was developing, wherever it was dissipated, we needed to communicate that um, to those in the air so we could recommend uh, targets for convective modules, you know, where to fly and where not to fly. Um, and additionally, we also had to keep a detailed log of the in-flight decisions that were being made um, and also deviations from uh, the original flight plan. Uh, so then also an on-ground responsibility during flights was uh, drops on processing and QC, and so drops on are essentially just reverse radio sounds that just drop right out of the plane. Um, and so basically um, the data from the drop sounds, um, we basically have a live feed of that data coming in on um, an NCAR specific computer, which was loaded up with um, their Aspen software, which is kind of an automatic QC mechanism for the drop sound data. Um, but we still did have to perform some manual quality control as well that Aspen didn't catch. Um, and then, yeah, just going through processing the data. If the, we deem the profile to be a good profile, um, then we would send the good drop sound profiles to the global telecommunication system. Um, and then through that, it would be uh, basically live incorporated um, into the global models. Um, and then, so being another uh, opportunity I got to take advantage of was being a flight scientist, again, up in the air during the flights. Um, and with that, again, we have kind of these live screens of live satellite imagery, um, but, but no loops or anything like we do on the ground. Um, and so with the live satellite imagery and our already designed flight plan, um, we would design convective modules, we would coordinate the drops on launches, where we like to drop them, um, and then around the convection. Um, then we also again have to adjust the flight patterns, flight patterns in response to either rapidly evolving weather conditions and or just timing constraints because the pilots get a certain time constraint for each flight, which is typically about eight hours. Um, and additionally, if uh, we weren't doing all that, we did get the opportunity to shadow the instrument teams as well. So we drop us on here's Halo, which is a uh, it's a uh, high altitude lidar observatory. And there's a there's a, an airborne precipitation radar and a lot of other things. And so if you had time, you could shout out the instrument teams to learn more about the actual um, data collection process. And if you're working with that data, kind of learn, um, you know, both the advantages of each of these instruments and also the limitations of these instruments as well. Uh, and then finally, if, you know, if we weren't doing, or if I wasn't doing all of those different jobs, um, and we had some downtime, um, there was a group in Cabo Verde with us um, that was launching uh, three radio sounds every day to study the diurnal cycle in Cabo Verde. Um, so if I had time, I would also assist um, with launching the weather balloons as well. Um, so that was a really fun and, and unique experience. Um, and again, the, the purpose of these radio sounds is to study the diurnal cycle locally and also um, the data from the radio sounds um, eventually will be incorporated into model the analysis projects. So amongst all of these different types of jobs, um, there were still some hard down days um, where we could actually kind of relax and explore the island, you know, just <laughs> not get too burned out. So, you know, we got to do a lot of, or I got to do a lot of very fun things. We got to go visit the tide pools, go seashell hunting, you know, play volleyball with some of the project leads. Um, we got to, um, there's kind of an ecological preservation um, organization there that helped hatch bait sea turtles. So that was super cute to go and watch the, the sea turtles hatch. Um, we 
we got to kind of wade in the water and swim with these baby lemon sharks um, along the coast. And then um, the uh, Sal Island in Cabo Verde is known for their salt mining, salt and salts in Portuguese. Um, and so they have these salt ponds, which are almost as dense as the Dead Sea. So swimming, we have to go swim in them, and that's a really cool experience because you're just so super buoyant. Um, so amongst all the work, uh, which is a lot of hard work, um, but it is very rewarding and you get some downtime to have some really cool experiences exploring the island. Um, and just, so with this field campaign and field campaign and field campaigns in general, it's really a great opportunity for making connections with people, collaborating with other scientists, you know, building a cohort, a cohort outside of the department. Um, and like I said, there's also a lot of really cool and unique experiences that you wouldn't get to anywhere else. So if you're interested um, in getting involved with the field campaign, um, you can either reach out to professors from the department who are involved with field campaigns. Um, Angela comes to mind on her um, as well. Um, or you can simply talk to your advisor and they might know someone outside of the department um, that is part of the field campaign and if it aligns with your research, you know, um, who knows, they might have funding available to uh, get you in the field and get you some of those awesome experiences. Uh, so yeah, that's all I had. So I think I'll save the questions for the end. But yeah, thank you all for your attention. So they've been, uh, they've held this summer school in Iceland and Greenland and other parts of Norway and Canada and um, also, I guess, Yosemite National Park. So they've had these summer schools in a lot of different locations and um, this particular year was in Norway. So um, I was particularly interested in this topic when I applied because my uh, research is on precipitation and clouds. And so, of course, I'm interested in then attending a summer school on the dynamics of the water cycle. Um, so let me kind of get us all oriented in where I went this last September. So on the left side of the map here, I'm showing Wisconsin, and Madison, Wisconsin has a little um, pin dropped on it. But then all the way, um, I, I do have a mouse, okay. Um, all the way over here you see, okay, there we go, all right. Um, okay, so this is where I was in um, Rondina National Park, um, which is near Ata, Norway, which is um, like a three hour train ride from Oslo. And so, um, but now that we're all oriented and where I spent a little bit of time, let's go to the next slide and talk about how I got there. So other than flying to uh, Norway and getting to Oslo, um, from once in Oslo, took a train, uh, actually it was a bus on my way there. So I took a bus from Oslo to Ota. Um, the, there was some construction going on at the train, so it was a bus for talk. And then um, once it was in Ota, um, we took a bus to the National Park Trailhead. So this is a picture I took on the bus. So it was like this really narrow, curvy road going up. Um, and then we ended up above tree line, and this was the hike from the trailhead to the cabin that we started. So there's a cabin na network in there when we spent time at a cabin called Randhus Boot. Um, so we had, it's about a four kilometer hike that we did to go in. And so we get there, we don't really see anything except fog and these alpine shrubs. Um, and so then when we get there, this is what Rand Vasbu in Randana National Park looks like. Um, so this is pictures that I took. Uh, this is the, um, the cabin. So there's like multiple buildings. There's like where we, the, the, you know, uh, where we, the, like 
dormitory buildings, there's the um, sort of kitchen and living space building, and then there's like the bath, separate bathrooms. And so this is a picture I took on a hike um, in the surrounding area. And then also on the left, there's a picture that I took from the uh, cabin looking out onto the lake. Um, so it's a beautiful space to spend time, so again, two weeks in this area. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about the summer school, because I've just gotten really excited about going to southern Norway and going to the mountains. Um, so this is a picture I took um, of the first day when you were introducing what is ACDC and the Climate Dynamics course, and one of our instructors came. Um, and again, you can see the lake behind the, um, the projector, so it's like, oh yeah, a little distracting, because you're learning about science, but then there's a lake right behind there, and so it's beautiful. Um, so the summer school consisted of a lot of things. So there were lectures, we had daily lectures, and then we had student-led summaries. So the following morning after a core lecture on you know, monsoons, then we would have um, the grad students participating, actually summarizing and giving descriptions of what we talked about and some of the key points, and then going over the questions. And, um, during this time, uh, no faculty or lead lecturers were allowed to talk. It was only students talking, only students contributing and asking questions and giving discussions. Only at the end were the faculty allowed to say, okay, okay, let me help with this one question. And so it was really an opportunity for grad students to you know, try and figure things out from what we talked about, what we learned about. And, um, so I do, I do have a picture of all of us, but there's about 20 of us. and. Um, so 20 grad students, we, it's an international group from all over the world, and um, there was no Wi-Fi. So no Wi-Fi, no cell service. So it was just the 20 of us trying to figure out different topics and, and kind of understand what we learned about without being able to Google it. So it's like using all of our different backgrounds to get to different discussions and answers. Um, so then um, we had also student research presentations, so an opportunity to talk about our own work. We all had different backgrounds, um, different topics, different areas. So even though it's advanced climate dynamics course, we had people who were um, more focused on glaciology, more focused on the you know, actual dynamics, or people who do uh, remote sensing, and um, so different topics. Um, cloud, cloud modeling, so physics, cloud physics modeling, you know, really a uh, big range of expertise. And so um, in addition to those discussions and those core lectures, we got to hike around the area and interpret the landscape, and I have some pictures from that as well. So then, um, in addition to those lectures, those day hikes and discussions, we had the opportunity to do a backpacking trip in the National Park, um, which was real fun, and I have some pictures from that too, I'll show you in a second. And then, um, for the final week, so it's two weeks, so for the second week, we split up into groups and worked on group projects. That um, The project topics were proposed by the different guest lecturers who came and, and brought uh, data to work with or brought um, simple models to work with because again we had no Wi-Fi so uh, if we wanted any cell service it was like a 0.7 mile hike up a hill and it's like how desperate are you for that one bar of service um, and sometimes you know you are you're like I just need this one paper I know about and you just hike for that to download that paper and use some data um, so here are some of the topics that we talked about during those discussions and during the core lectures so um, atmospheric moisture transport, transport floods, flood variability, regional climate change and, and hydroclimate, um, soil moisture, water cycle, um, and paleoclimate proxies. Um, so cryosphere is one of the topics and, and changes in the cryosphere, sea level rise and ice sheets. And, and again, um, sort of a paleo um, climate perspective on that as well. And then um, I, I mentioned monsoons and also the um, AMA. Um, so, I just wanted to show this slide from the group project that I was a part of. One of the um, group members had a really great way of putting together all of our topics into this plan, and I feel like Andrew DeZambo, who we're here, would be really excited to see this. Um, <laughs> so some of you know who that is. Um, he's a grad student here. Anyways, so um, my group pro so the group that I was in worked on a project where we combined uh, observations from a field campaign called Prom Ice in the Greenland Ice Sheet with um, a really high resolution um, Arctic, region, re Arctic reanals regional reanalysis, so CARA, and then CMIP 6. And then in addition, we um, some group members worked with a simple model to simulate what's called a stupa. So let me just show you the stupa really quick. So um, here is a stupa, and this, this little um, 
this is a person right next to the student. So this is pretty big. Um, this is a way that um, water can be stored in the in the dry season, or in the, I guess, not so season, in the, in the warm season. And so you can preserve ice and have water resources. So this is a way that's been used, or this is a method that has been used to preserve water, and this is something that people are kind of talking about, like, oh, we're thinking about climate change and ice sheets and, and glaciers and how those things are changing. And, um, so we kind of combined these topics um, together. And so I specifically worked with the um, Copernicus Arctic Regional Reanalysis, which is a 2.5 kilometer resolution um, data over Greenland. Uh, and this was this data and these topics were provided by a glaciologist who was one of the lecturers, Ruth Matram. Uh, so here's a picture that I took. Uh, let's transition real quick to a picture. Um, so we got a chance to see the Northern Lights. We were, I was really happy and really lucky to see that. Um, very pleased with the way this iPhone picture turned out as well. So that was a really amazing thing to see. Um, and here's a picture from one of our day hikes. Um, you can see it's definitely really, it was a fairly hard hike, really fun. Um, so that's kind of that attached to that uh, lake that I showed a picture of earlier. Um, so beautiful day hike. Um, here's a picture of the group. So a lot of us um, on this hike. I'm right here, I'm wearing the AOS shirt, <laughs> you recognize that. Um, okay, and then here's a picture from backpacking that I took. Um, so we were able to take a boat um, down the lake and to a different trailhead where we then hiked in for a couple of miles and we spent two nights out in the, um, in the, in the National Park. Um, and I was very happy uh, with the food for the two weeks that I was there. So uh, on the left, I'm showing just a picture of one of the snacks that we had while backpacking. Um, so lots of different things, both vegetarian and meat options. And then um, while we were at the cabin, uh, there was also, so we had a chef who joined us for backpacking and also a chef at the cabin. And so the um, we had waffles almost every day. And uh, I'll just end with that, that if you're interested in this type of opportunity, like going to a summer school, and I can show a lot of highlights here, I know. Um, if you're interested in a graduate student, um, like summer school opportunity, um, I would recommend following different organizations and institutes that um, have these on social media. So I'd heard of ACDC because someone did a seminar. Um, I believe Melissa Breeden gave a seminar years ago, and I know Aaron Thomas, who's also a grad, was a grad student here, also did this summer school. So I'd heard about it before, but because I was on Facebook and on different groups, I knew they were taking applications. So um, that's a way to, to see when, when they're um, ready to take applications or when it's actually happening. And then um, some email listservs might have opportunities as well. But I've done a few summer schools, so if you're interested in talking more about um, this type of opportunity, please reach out to me. I'm happy to, to chat about it. And I do have a thank you questions slide as well, but let's save those for um, after readers. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rudra Thakur, and I'm a second year graduate student. I'm still a master's student, so I don't know if I fit the PhD supplemental title here, but it's a good opportunity that I got during the summer. It's called the Advanced Study Program, Graduate Visitor Program. It's, it's not an acronym, shout out to Till Wagner, it's an initialization. So it's ASPGVP and not ASPGWP. <laughs> so it's, it's a fun program. So it's hosted by ANCAR, which is National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's in Colorado Boulder. And it basically gives opportunity to any graduate student to visit ANCAR and work with the scientists there for two to eight months. So the application is pretty straightforward. Uh, also, if anyone's interested, I know a couple of graduate students are going to apply, but the application deadline is usually first week of November sometime around that and then you hear back by the end of December. So if anyone wants to apply, reach out to me and I can probably help you with how to do it. But moving on, I was there for three months in summer and I was hosted by Christine Shields, Alice Dubivy, Marika Holland and Laura Landrum. So Christine is like one of the atmospheric labor person and the rest three are the CA's experts. So I was 
I went there to work, to continue my master's work and uh, to look into climate models because Ankar developed this community health system model 2.0 and then I know Gerald was also there for a month. We kind of were left for a week, so probably I didn't get chance to see him though. Anyway, uh, moving on, uh, just a little bit about my research, like why I went there. So what are atmospheric rivers? It's just a long, narrow corridor of moist and warm air going into a region. Uh, it's a different than a moisture intrusion event, and I like to use the analogy, which some of you already know, is that a moisture intrusion event would be just a person walking by towards the region, whereas uh, an atmospheric river would be someone who is sprinting towards the region. So there's like a subtle difference between what's a moisture intrusion and an atmospheric river. All atmospheric rivers are moisture intrusion, but not all moisture intrusion atmospheric rivers. And you can see one of them in the, in the Pacific sector there. So moving on, I already looked like what the AR heat map, like what the AR frequency is in MERA. MERA is like a reanalysis data set to simulate the reality. And it shows you like for 1980 to 2020, which is the observational time period, you can see that there are like winter ARs and then summer ARs, AR being atmospheric rivers. But they tell you nothing about how they're gonna change in the future. Also, if you look at the frequency color bar, it's only 1.2% of the time. So you don't have enough data set to do nice and cool statistics on it because they are so rare in the Arctic. Climate models, on the other hand, because they have ensemble members, they have like different simulations, you can use those different ensemble members to actually look into different ARs and then do nice statistics about that. So that was my visit to NCAR, like use the climate model, learn how to do that, and like see the nice results. The good thing about NCAR is that you have so many people there, like they also point you or like guide you for your previous research, so I ended up changing a lot of my observational plots. I was using real analysis data set for sea ice, and I got a lot of feedback that you should not do that. So that was like one big takeaway from the visit that don't trust real analysis data set for everything. Trust one which is trusted by the community. Just a fun story, 7th of May was the last day for me in Madison, and 6 a.m. on that day I submitted my AOS 575 paper, I was here all night. 3 p.m. I was also moving out of my apartment, so I had to like clean up my apartment, pack everything, also pack for the trip. 8 p.m. we were like watching Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, went to Bar Taco, saw Grant there, and 8th of May, I just in the morning, 9 a.m., I went for Boulder. So crazy night, 7th May, finishing up my Madison things and then just going to, to don't do this, like don't procrastinate. <laughs> yeah. But a surprise that 8th of May, I'm pretty sure you'll identify who I met on the airport. It was Grant Petty, and he was also going to Boulder. And I found it a really nice coincidence that I ran into him, and then I just mentioned him that he's going to be on my talk as well. But I was there for three months, like 8th of May to 7th of August, pretty long time, three months. Boulder is a fun place to go. You go like you can go on hikes and you have so many people there to talk to. You got CU Boulder there and a lot of cool people at CU Boulder who you, you can share research and just get their feedbacks as well. But some of the research stuff I accomplished between these three months is that I changed the data sets I was using thanks to the review. Uh, I also looked at ARs and sea ice loss, like how the ARs are, like that was my actual big result during the summer, like how much sea ice loss you see. I ended up presenting there, uh, presenting the results at Polar AMS, which was on 10th of August, so just after I got back. And then how are atmospheric rivers represented in CSM2, like the model CSM2, whether the climate models are doing a good job or not. Moving on, I was also attending the group meetings by Jennifer Kay. Some of you might know the name from, like she was the one who developed CSM, like the Community Earth System Model. And she's a faculty at CU Boulder, amazing person. So I was like going to the weekly group meetings, which like introduced to me the work of her students who are also working on Arctic or Antarctic stuff, and like how maybe we can collaborate on some of the stuff, including precipitation and atmospheric rivers and stuff. And also there's a polar working group at NCAR, like a, group of eight people who are like doing polar science, so that also like show me like there is a world other than ARs in the Arctic. Of course there is, but like you get too much focused on your research questions, which sometimes blocks your vision to a specific question 
you visit these places, you meet different people, and they're like, okay, yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I should look at a bigger picture and not just like look at something so small uh, in a particular region, of course. Uh, one thing to know about NCAR is that they also have like different working groups. Like they have biogeochemistry, they have, they have atmospheric working group. They also do like weather stuff. They have actually a really nice research aviation facility. They have like two big planes which actually go and collect data from from different storm systems and stuff. So it's not limited to climate people. If you're doing like weather or like mesoscale stuff, air quality stuff, or like eddies and like ocean stuff, feel free to like apply to this program and you, you would have a good opportunity. So the outcome of this was that you see a big CS loss happening into the earth deck. Like you see a loss, instantaneous CS loss rate as high as like 15 square kilometers per day in the regions of West Greenland and the Nordic Seas. And that's a pretty decent loss for the months of winter because winter is the growing season. So you're not supposed to see sea ice loss. So this loss actually inhibits your sea ice growth in the winter. Another big thing was that actually CSM2, like the model, does a really good job in capturing this heat map. So zooming Mera is your reality, and CSM2 is your climate model. It smoothed out like the contours because I'm using 40 ensemble members. Like I have like 40 different plots with distinct features, and then you average them out. So this just said, like it's agreeing to the reality. So that was a big thing. Like you can actually use CSM2 to do more statistics once you have more. Uh, more of these case studies or more of these cases of ARs in the Arctic. So hooray for that. And the last thing was that how to do like climate change simulation, like how do you account for climate change in AR? And that was like a tricky thing to, to answer. Like people ask questions like, you cannot define an extreme event in 2019 based on your current extreme definition. So we came up with a methodology and I don't want to go more into that because, oops, uh, that's an error, because I want to save, save some results, because this is part of my master's thesis, so I don't want to spoil everything and like be a, like a spoiler alert warning. But there's an upcoming movie, which is called Arctic. It's Arctic Atmospheric Reverse Changes, Transition, and Impacts in a Changing Climate, starring me. The advising <laughs> directors are Steve Weverus and Christine Shields. Co-advising directors are Alice Marika Laura. Academic director is Tristan, and I have some nice friends working on the music part of it, to <laughs> the music cast. And there's a lot of support uh, cast, which includes a lot of grad students and a lot of professors. And it's coming soon to your nearby AOS 811. So don't miss out on the on the movie next spring, hopefully in March or April. But the fun stuff. So there was a there was a visit to the research aviation facility at NCAR, so that's me on the Gulfstream 5. I did not fly that because I don't have a license. <laughs> I'm pretending to do research, I'm pretending to fly this airplane, everything is pretentious with me, but that's me trying to fly the airplane. Uh, another fun thing was a polar workshop, and the AR in the polar is supposed to be atmospheric river, so this is a nice research group at Boulder, including Jan Lenners, who's not at CU now, he moved into a private company, but Christine Shields, Andrew Winters, who was a graduate student at this department a long time ago, and he's a faculty there, and then a lot of other grad students who are working on Arctic and Antarctic ARs. We had a one full day of like show your research, collaborate, think, think about things which you're not thinking about, which was really helpful because I was clearly thinking wrong at that point. Uh, Steve, my advisor, visited, so a lot of hiking. Like I, I felt obligated to include fun stuff and not just talk about research to like motivate you people to go do this thing as well. So that's Steve, he's my advisor, and my research group, it, like Lorenzo, Laura, Christine, and Marika from left to right, and that's me. If you're in Boulder, you hike and you do work. That's the things to do. And we saw a moose and a baby moose. That was one of the highlight. And that was my trip to Boulder, actually. Yeah, thank you. Oh yeah, if you have any questions for all four of us, we still have 10 minutes, so shoot questions. Excuse yeah. The first talk. Yeah. Um, basically, you make your plans uh, to lose. Back in the last century, I 
taught a uh, couple, couple of times. I taught a course there. Ah. And uh, have you met our colleague uh, Jean-Pierre Ferrand? Uh, yes, yeah, actually, I believe so, yeah. Um, he, he was at Kness, right? Huh? Yeah, Can, at Kness. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's great, <laughs> yes. Yes, he. Yeah, <laughs>
and, and I do this now on any of the grants that I write, I write in three months of travel for a student to go visit the collaborators somewhere else. Those are, those are easy things to do. Um, just as a quick follow-up on that, sorry. There's also a university travel grant, like there is a department travel grant and then there's a university travel grant. So you can merge both of them together. There is no rule that says that you cannot get both of them. And the university travel grant can go up to $1,200 at different, like the, the cycles, like the October 1 and now the November and December should be coming up. So if anyone's going to AGU or AMS, then I would say apply to both AOS and also the university one because they, they also give you grants for, for travel. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for your questions and for being here. So see you next Wednesday.